Okay. Let's jump into it. Welcome. Thank you for coming. I know this has been a long and intense week, and thank you for choosing to spend your last hour of session with me. Um, <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, explain a little bit about who I am, and also I'm just going to go over what I want to do in the presentation, just so that you can be sure that this is the one you want to be in. So who am I? I'm, uh, I'm a user interface systems architect with My Planet Digital, uh, based in Toronto. They're a wonderful uh, design and technology company that uh, are very, very committed to uh, excellence in user experience. And that's why I'm there, because it's a very, very hospitable at uh, atmosphere for being productive uh, along those lines, and that's my passion. So thank you, My Planet, for being there. Um, what does it mean to be a user interface systems architect? Well, what it means is I've got two heads. Um, the first head has big ears because it likes to listen to users. And what I mean by that is I like to put myself into a, 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 an empathy, a deep empathy with users to find out as much as possible about what they're doing as they use applications so that I can help them uh, you know, have uh, more, uh, better experiences doing that. The other head, uh, propeller head, uh, is a software developer. So I've actually spent uh, a couple of, well, over two decades doing software development and uh, pretty much, I think, two decades doing uh, usability design and whatever the uh, current phrase is to describe that kind of work, user, be, uh, user interface or user experience. Um, so, so the idea is that there's two kinds of consciousness um, that I like to try and fuse, try to bring together. I like to bridge the gap between those two perspectives. So you'll see some of that in this presentation. And what I want to do in this presentation is open two doors. Behind the first door, there's a warm and sunny place where users are happy, and they're happy because they can comprehend their user interfaces. Behind the other door is where developers build components for user interfaces. Now, if we can open both those doors, I would like to think that we could have new conversations about how to bring the values, the perspectives, the needs, and so on from the door there, the sunny place, into this room so that developers can actually build the components in a way that is actually easy, that does help users comprehend those interfaces. So that's the goal. That's the goal of this presentation. To do that, I want to present you with two keys. The first key is the concept of user narratives, and that will touch on uh, one of my big passions, role-oriented <coughs> role UX design. I'll be touching on what that is. Also, the idea of idioms, which is really a way of looking at language beyond <coughs> language as English, French, native language, that kind of thing. And then also talking about the what, is the, what do I mean by narratives in, in terms of real life, and what do I mean by <coughs> narratives in terms of user interface design? It involves roles and idioms. Just gonna get a drink. So the second, the second key is some critical technical information that helps explain things that would be useful if you care about how words get on the screen I want to show you how that happens from a technical point of view. It won't be complicated, it won't be deep, it won't be difficult. I guarantee you'll be able to understand it. And I also want to talk about how, from a user experience design point of view, it's really important to organize the words that get on the screen because that's part of the dimension of user experience design. I also need to touch on this, the fact that Drupal currently excludes that dimension of user experience design uh, from, from those designers, from uh, of that uh, We'll get into it. And then finally, I want to touch on an alternative approach, which is actually inclusive of that perspective uh, from the user experience design perspective. So that's what I'm going to be doing. Uh, if you want these two keys, please stay. If you don't, then there's still time to go and catch something else, so you're welcome to, uh, to make that adjustment. So. First, I want to talk about three fundamental concepts uh, from the user experience point of view. These are sort of three tricks of the trade that, um, that I use uh, routinely. The first is a good definition of usability. From my point of view, usability is simply the lack of suffering on the part of the user. 
That's why I like this image, the image of barbed wire dancing shoes, because, of course, if you were to use them, it would hurt. You would be suffering. Uh, it's a good visual metaphor for the scenario that we're trying to avoid in terms of UX design. The next thing is the concept of uh, <coughs> usage context. I use this symbol, uh, this is kind of my mascot, uh, because it defines for me uh, the meaning of functionality. Functionality has no meaning outside of the usage context. This, the function of the traffic cone, is absolutely meaningless outside of its usage context. It simply is there to point to all the things around it. So to me, it's a very handy symbol. And you'll see that coming up through the presentation where I'm wanting to draw your attention to usage context. And the last thing, the main weapon, is these two questions. If you want to do user experience analysis, these are very, very useful questions. Who is the user? What are their tasks? They're very simple questions, but they're, if you've done US, user experience design, you'll know they're often very difficult to answer. But they're very important. So through the presentation, I want to make reference to a project that we're doing at my planet. It's still underway. Uh, we're still in the process of doing it. And it's a basically a registration system for music exams in two countries. That's Canada and the US. In Canada, it's with the Royal Conservatory of Music. And the same system exams are being used by Carnegie Hall uh, uh, for the retrievement program in the US. We've built two uh, websites at my planet, separate websites. There's two contexts of usage. Now, the main thing is they both share this, the, the, the um, business of selling exams is a core part of their business. So the registration for exams has to be very easy because if it's not, people will drop out of the process and they will lose money or they will call customer support and it will be a drain on their resources. So there's an economic factor in both those things. So it's very important that we get that process right. And the other thing which is very important here is that um, there's different user types and that's going to come up a lot through this presentation. So the US uh, situation is actually, it's a smaller uh, population of students, and that's where we've begun the process of, you know, in terms of uh, building the pilot project. And this is what we've built. And t before we got there, we actually prototyped it. We had a very uh, richly interactive prototype that we used to sort of proof the concept of the main uh, function of the registration uh, uh, interaction system. And from that, we built uh, this site. I'll just give you a quick video tour of uh, what that looks like from this point of view. So people come in there, they, they get into the registration through that gateway. They declare who they are. Are they a student registering for themselves? Are they a parent registering for their children? Or are they a teacher registering on behalf of uh, their students? Now, these are checkboxes. They could, could theoretically be all of those things. As they press those checkboxes, the user interface itself is extended to provide new tabs. And under those tabs are the uh, interfaces that they use to begin the registration process from that perspective, from that uh, individual perspective. Now, they all funnel back into this common wizard that takes you through those steps of basically identifying who you are, picking the exam that you want to take, choosing a time and date that you'd like to take it on and then heading off to the checkout page to, to pay for it. That's it, that's what we were trying to do. And that's what we want to be really, really simple. So we did user testing on this, and we learned a couple of things, well, a few things, but in two categories. Some was structural, some was just about how is the, the, the uh, arrangement of the elements and the interaction methods that we use. Uh, we learned things about you know, how to improve that. There also were a lot of things about the, the language that was used in the interface as well that sort of gets people through it. And that's what I want to focus on. And here I want to play uh, a couple of clips which are basically uh, very, very articulate feedback from one of the testers. He's, I, I didn't pay him, but he did actually say precisely what we needed to hear in terms of um, the, the feedback around these issues. So it's really, really excellent um, uh, sound clips I want to hear. So hopefully this will work. So this is the, the first, so I've got two of these. You won't be able to see it. I didn't make it big enough for you to see because it's not about seeing, it's about listening. Uh, I still don't know what a founding school is. 
so I'll leave it blank. I don't know what that means. So I don't know if that's this te the school I teach at uh, as the teacher, or if that's the school that the student goes to. Yeah, well, because I don't know what an assessment is, in a way. I mean, I'm assuming it's, like, I sort of can work it out, but I wouldn't have, um, like, schedule an exam. I mean, here we're trying to book an exam, and really everything is, is worded around assessment. Uh, I would not think exam for an assessment, but if there was a log as to what all of these things meant, and... <laughs> Maybe a glossary of terms so we could find out what founding school meant. If you have a user asking for a glossary of terms, you know you have a problem. So that's what we're trying to solve, right? So terminology was one of the big issues. And then there's another one. Can you summarize again like what your overall impression is? I think the language needs to change for each type of person. I would, if I'm a teacher, I would want to see the words that say register my student. Yeah. And, um, the language, since I'm a teacher and I had to, the language was written for, for the student yeah. and, and not for the teacher. Awesome. Yeah, because I'm not, because I'm trying to do something as a teacher and all of the words are guiding students rather than teachers. Okay. So I don't know if it makes sense to have three different types of language that click up when you see student, parent, teacher. Because yeah. there are three different positions in the information stream. So here he's picking up on the fact that there are different types of users and that he was being spoken to from the wrong angle. He was being spoken to as a student, and he's not a student, and it didn't make sense to him, and he was very frustrated by that. So those are the two major issues that we're trying to uh, address. So really, it's about the language, but it's about the language from the point of view of going beyond the native language. It's not English, it's not French, it's not German, etc. It's about idioms and whatever is involved uh, in association with speaking to someone that's playing a particular role. So I want to go into those two areas just to clarify some more uh, details about that. So in terms of idioms, let's just take a quick look at that. We want, uh, we want this to be comfortable. If we have unfamiliar, unfamiliar terms in the interface, it's not comfortable. We've got barbed wire shoes. If we have generic terms, which is often a solution in UX design because you want to make it fit for everybody, but I would say that's equally uncomfortable because it's not speaking in a resonant kind of way. If we have familiar terms, then it's comfortable, at which point we've, re we've achieved our nirvana as UX designers, the entire interface becomes invisible, no one notices. That's the best we can hope for. Other than that, it's pain. We want no pain. We want people to just go dancing. So, roles. Life is a sequence of roles. Roles happen all the time. Roles are about what your mind is focused on at any given time, and that's constantly shifting. So a given day might be something like this. Uh, I'm cooking breakfast, I walk the dog, <clears throat> I'm commuting to work, I'm emailing. I'm not really a music student, but I could be a music student. And if I am, I may at some point want to take an exam, so I become an exam candidate and I want to register for them. So in order to fulfill roles like this, we also need tools. So the kind of tools we need to cook breakfast, we might need a stove and a toaster. To walk a dog, we might need a leash and a dog. Uh, to be a commuter, we need something like a subway train. So all of these things are outside things that we need to carry out those roles. So the, the objective and the capability of role-oriented design is to supply the right tools at the right time. If, for example, you decide to cook breakfast while walking your dog on the subway, you know you probably have a confusing time, it's probably a problem. So the point is you wouldn't do that, but why, in terms of user interface, would we throw up all of the tools that someone could possibly use in one space and expect them to get through it? The whole point behind role-oriented design is that you wouldn't do that. Just the right tools, nothing missing and nothing ex in excess. That's the objective. The other thing about role-oriented design 
this is my other brain speaking, is that it actually provides a very good pathway between those two doors, from that sunny spot where the user should be to the back room where the developers are. Role-oriented design provides a pathway uh, that informs, it shines light from one space into the other. Let's just follow it through quickly. So here's all our users on the outside. Mary is a music teacher. She does exam registration for her students. She's a music examiner as well. And she's been doing that for so long that she's now a, a, an exam center representative. Those are all various roles that she could play. The one I want to look at is exam registration. And that consists of a set of tasks. She wants to manage her student list so that she can decide who she's dealing with in this session. She picks out a student from there. She then uh, as assigns the exam selection that that student should be taking, makes the booking, and pays on their behalf, and presumably she'll bill them afterwards. And in order to do that, this, she has the tools on the screen to ke get through all those tasks. Now, I like to call these things screenware. All these things that appear on the screen, it's like software, it's like hardware, it's screenware. And it's something to consider in terms of um, tools, a tool set, which things do you need and which things don't you need. So the nice thing about that, too, then, is that once you're looking at screenware from the point of view of, of tools, there's a relationship between those elements on the screen and the information architecture, which is behind the screen, which the user doesn't really see in an explicit way, except through these kinds of representations. And from the IA point of view, we're it doesn't take very long to get into the actual data itself. That's where it all lives. Of course, you'd go through something like a view screen or some kind of means of extracting that data from the database. So role-oriented design has a, an impact on all these layers, what it looks like on the screen, the layout, and so on, the information architecture, how that's um, uh, shaped, the data retrieval methods, the kind of views you might construct, and even perhaps the data structures themselves. So we want light from the user's uh, perspective, from the user's world, to shine all the way through these layers so that it can actually be shaped properly in such a way that it makes it comfortable and comprehensible for, the, for those users. So let's get into the narratives, uh, connect a few dots to define what that means. So a user narrative, uh, basically, I said it involves idioms, so we have to look at it uh, from the point of view of um, the terminology differences. Um, so this is a critical factor. In, the, in Canada, we register for exams. In the US, we register for assessments. What we did, cruelly, was we tested a Canadian with the American application, and that's why he was so confused. He didn't understand the language, but it did point out the, the, the importance of getting that language right. And then we have to handle roles. A good way to look at roles is in terms of mindsets. We have three. We have the student, we have the parent, we have the teacher, and the mindsets are register me, register my child, or register my students. They're quite different, they're subtle, it's a subtle difference, but they are different. Enough different that it confused our user, and he spoke <laughs> verbally or extensively about that. And of course, they're all different usage contexts. So life, if life is uh, a set of changing roles, if it's a set of shifting mindsets, probably doesn't look like this. In graphic terms, it probably looks more like this. Our consciousness is shifting from one set of tasks, one set of goals to another. So in very crude graphical terms, it looks like a wavy line, not a flat line. Now applications try to mimic that in a way. So they try to accommodate these, these mindsets in, to a degree that people will sort of resonate with it. But unfortunately, it doesn't always work out because it's actually going to a different pattern. And we need to understand why that happens. This is where it hurts. Role-oriented designs uh, allow this harmonization to take place between the, the narratives, the user narratives within the application and the narratives of real life that the user is simply passing through. Now, within the Drupal UX community, we have some obstacles for this. One is it's inconvenient, but it's there. The Drupal defines roles differently than I'm using it defines roles as sets of permissions. That may seem like a small thing. 
but I think actually it's just one of those things where it's uh, it's um, it's an unfortunate sort of lack of power of use of that term. Permission sets are fixed for any given user. Roles, because they're shifting mindsets, can change constantly. So if you're trying to design a user interface that accommodates those shifting mindsets, it doesn't make sense to use a fixed reference point. You cannot do it from that fixed set of permissions. You have to look at it from the point of view of what are the shifting goals, the shifting task sets that they're trying to uh, get through. Drupal also doesn't support the ability to uh, express idiomatically. Uh, and that's uh, something I want to go into. And, and this is where we get, we pick up the other key. This is where we're going to get into a little bit of technical stuff. What is a string? I'm just curious, does anybody know what I mean when I say what is a string? Could you raise your hand if you do know? And if, if you don't know, could you raise your hand? Okay, glad you came. This is a string. A string is basically just a set of characters bounded between quotes, and these are the things that end up on the screen. That's kind of the formal structure of it. Now, here's a thought experiment. If we think of strings, we have to, of course, think of words, which, of course, is related to thoughts. If we think about the kinds of thoughts that we have in our heads in this room, there might be certain words that are sort of more common in all of our heads compared to another room next door where they're talking about perhaps uh, Drupal security or uh, even theming. There are different kind of resonant spots in terms of the, the terms and, and sort of population densities and so on. So I use this metaphor, this grass metaphor, to describe the idea that thoughts actually come in clusters. And so therefore, so with the words, so with all the terminology and so on. And if we look at it from the point of view of what I see role-oriented strings uh, being organized like, they would be in these kinds of groups where you can see some kind of uh, self-consistency. But in Drupal, if you were to look at where the strings are arranged, it looks like this. This presents a kind of practical problem for you UX designers in that there's no systematic way to go in there and fine tune any of those strings because it's basically a hunt and destroy mission individually one at a time. And that's not cost effective and it's not likely to happen. So therefore, the wrong strings end up on the screen. So what do we do about that? Let's go into it a little bit deeper and see if we can find a way towards a solution. Strings have a secret life. There's the strings that you can see on the front of the screen. That's what the users see. And there's strings on the inside, behind the screen, on the inside of the code that users never see. This is an example plucked out of the code in Drupal. The string on the left, bounded in quotes, is the word name. As a user, you wouldn't see that. On the right, in quotes, is the words blog entry. That's what you're going to see. So there it is. That's where I got it from. And you can see all those red words on the left are the words that are internal. And these are the words that developers care very much about. The words on the right, which are blue, are the ones that get on the screen. And you can see, for example, with the, the second one there, it's actually HTML. HTML is basically one long string. So the thing is, these code strings, the red ones, should never change unless there's some kind of functional change intended by the developer. I think of them more as nails. You knock them into place to hold things together in a specific way, and if you change that, things fall apart and it breaks. So you can't change those strings. On the other hand, the strings on the outside, the blue ones, have to be flexible. Otherwise, we'll never achieve those comfort levels. So by definition, we have to be able to modify those. They're quite different in nature and in character. There's a logical problem, and that is that all of those strings are really red because they're all inside the code. They're all inside that field of grass that I was talking about, and therefore they're generally inaccessible to UX design processes because it's really too difficult to manage them like that. 
So this could be a complete disaster, except for one thing. From early on, Drupal has made <laughs> uh, itself a goal to dominate the world, which of course uh, required that it have the capacity to, uh, to speak in different languages. So it does have a very strong language translation function called the T function. So if you look at this again, you'll notice that the blue string on the right is actually embedded inside a T function. What that means is that you can find them and you can translate them, but you can't translate them into idioms or role-based perspectives like that. You can't nuance them to that degree. Just change them from English to French to Spanish or whatever. So in terms of our exam registration system, that presents a bit of a problem. Uh, here's the, the T function dimension. We have the original words, uh, my examination. And then we have a French equivalent. I'm not gonna try and pronounce these. And a German one and a Spanish one. That's, that's how it works right now with Drupal. That's the T function basically in terms of the space of the words. Already, as soon as we uh, take on the task of building this site to work in America, in the US, we have a problem because they use different terms. And then T doesn't really accomplish that. It's not designed to. So the idiomatic dimension is missing. It gets even more complex when you consider those roles. That each of these sets of terms, each of these pairs of terms in each language also has to be modified to uh, be comfortable for the actual role, the mindset of the, the type of user. So we've actually got a lot of things to look after here to make it comfortable in all instances. So why have we just restricted ourselves to that one dimension of a language translation? I think it's just because it's been hidden, because those strings are in the code and people that care about that perhaps don't know it. That's one reason why I'm giving this presentation. There's also a, a convenience factor from the development point of view. It is a bit convenient or is considered convenient to be able to just type those words in as you're busy doing the, uh, the rest of your work and uh, you don't have to do anything very complicated. But there's a problem with convenience. Um, this is convenient for situations like this. But we know in um, you know, extended use, it's a different matter. It means you know, these things are actually a bad idea. Now the equivalent here, where we've seen this before, we have seen this before, because we not only have embedded strings, we have embedded styles, we have embedded scripts in our history. We know that the graphic designers would not allow embedded styles to happen now. We know that interaction designers would not allow embedded JavaScript to happen now. What I'm saying is that embedded strings are no different. That's the kind of situation we're talking about. So if we want to go into those other dimensions, we have to go beyond the T function. So I want to describe how we've approached this with our application at MyPlanet uh, to address that real problem that, uh, you know, that we need to fix with the usability. So basically the idea is to extract these strings from the code. We need to go on a rescue mission, pull them out of there. And we do that by substituting, not user-facing through, we substitute for that what I would call semantic keys. What I mean by semantic keys is that they do, they do two things. They describe the usage context for this string and they link the internal code to an external file. In our case, we used a file where the strings are actually defined. So we produce something like this. So what I mean by semantic is that you can tell when it says label underscore blog that it's probably a label and it probably has something to do with blog. You don't have to really guess too much of that. And therefore it's not a big surprise to see the, the blue words blog entry uh, associated with that. Then we have another one, label first name. It's obviously a label that's associated with an input that gathers the person's first name. Same with label last name. Then we have a prompt, some, we ask a question on the screen are you male or female? We have prompt gender. Then we have a couple of answers that they could possibly give. Option, underscore gender, underscore male, and then the equivalent for female. So there's the semantic uh, sort of meanings on the left that, that actually I think is very easy from the developer point of view to simply describe those things as you're doing the rest of the logic of your code. You don't have to think about the meaning and the nuance of what the user should be seeing there. When we saw that graph where the wavy line wasn't jiving with the user's real life, it's because 
the developer puts their mindset into the user interface because that's what they're forced to do in this system. That's why it disconnects from the user experience. So we also need to help the developers here as well. I, mean, I think this could be equally helpful for them. Certainly I found it that way in my own experience. So we can also handle the role dimension through the use of uh, what is called a variable. So that thing over the very far right dollar sign role is basically like a little box. And in that box it will be strings and the string could be, it's gonna be one of student, parent or teacher. And that is glued to the piece on the left where it says label, blog, underscore, underscore. And that little dot there glues those two things together so you end up with these kinds of things. Label blog is our, our uh, original one. Then you can actually modify that string through this system without changing the code. You can get access to a student version where it says student's blog entry and a teacher version which says teacher's journal or whatever you want it to say. You can change those blue strings without, without risking breaking the code without having to change the code whatsoever. So that means the strings are freed and accessible to UX design. So we've got these two usage contexts. We're dealing with idioms, we're dealing with roles. We end up with basically these kinds of strings for that one expression, my examination. We've got it in two languages in, in Canada. We've got English and French. Two languages in the US, English and Spanish. And we've got the three role uh, 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 sort of expressions of it. Now we've done that through a module it's a, a module I wrote, I, we call it uh, the user narratives module. And I'll just explain very quickly how it works. It's really, its job is to help us organize those strings. So it, it, this is where the grass is. It's all in there in that random order. Core and contrib modules, we want them to basically look like this, where we can get to them and, and tune them nicely. We, what we do is we build a custom adapter module and we use the user narrative module to basically route things through to, the, uh, to this, th where the string files are. I should explain, the custom adapter module is simply, go it's, it is custom. This is not a generic solution. This, this is where we're at. It's just simply a custom solution. It's using the form API, which is basically going through all the input forms, pulling out the sp specific strings that we want to change, and then routing them through to a different place. And that different place is something that the user experience designer can look at, evaluate, discuss with the client, and get those strings exactly right for, for the uh, situation. So we don't have to touch code. So update on the project. This is one, I'll just briefly touch on it. This is one area where it's the, it's the student's perspective. Uh, just before the registration wizard, this is how they would launch it. There's a register now button there. It's a fairly straightforward, simple interface. It's a button and basically a list of previous exams or pending uh, uh, requests for exams. But when we get to the parent, it's a bit different. We have a list, and on the left it says manage your family list. So it speaks to the parent in their language. It says, does the family member have a student ID? And it says something which I can't quite read about uh, the student's name, uh, uh, about the child's name, sorry. And for the teacher, it changes the language to manage your student list. Does the student have a student ID? Add new students. So it's just speaking in the right terms for that, uh, for that role. It's not huge, it's not a huge difference, but it's just enough to make it comfortable. We're just shaving those pointy bits off the shoes here. So that's basically it, that's, that's the concepts. Those are the keys, hopefully the doors are open. And what I'd like to see now is if we, using this knowledge, could now start to have new discussions about this concept to see, is it generally valuable? Um, and if so, what can we do in terms of evolving Drupal to allow us as UX designers to have access to those two additional dimensions. So that's my presentation. Um, I think I should do this bit too. That I think you're supposed to do your homework here. You um, go to that place. If you like it, go to this place and <laughs> give us your feedback. If you don't like it, you're 45 minutes late for the session you should have been in. Um, so yeah, I think we've still got time for questions. So if anybody would like to do that.
when you put the string into a specific file uh, to define separately, uh, how do you handle the search? Speaking from what point of view, me as a developer or me as a user experience designer? As, as, as a user try to click search on the web, so because the string defined separately, so the search engine need to handle that. Um, well, I mean, because it's, you, it's basically a resource file that the, the user experience designer has access to. Uh, in, uh, in a text editor, you could simply look through and find the string that you want, or you could search within that. It's just a text file. So I've never actually experienced a problem with that. Uh, and from the developer point of view, um, it also works because when you're looking at the code, you see the semantic key, and if you do a search through your directories for definitions for that, I found it relatively easy. I haven't seen a problem with that. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I had a question which is generally, I needed some information. Uh, I don't know if this is the right place to ask, but it's really quick. I also had a similar problem in which I'm trying to make sure that I don't, I don't actually check out uh, or do geo uh, IP to check where the, where the user is coming from, uh, but I want to make sure that the language is suitable for American English users and British English users. Uh, and so I was confused how to do this because I was actually thinking, should I use Google Translate uh, API and translate everything on a cron, um, or how, sh how, how do you actually approach this problem? Well, um, first of all, uh, th this technique, I should say, comes from uh, desktop application building. Uh, I used to work for commercial desktop uh, vendors, and this was the standard practice. And there we would actually treat that, you know, in the same way as we treat translation, we translate to different languages as well. Um, so it kind of ha handled both those things at once. Um, one story I've heard in terms of the English versus uh, uh, American, for example, is that Amazon, I think, had this problem where the word shipping didn't work in the UK. It just didn't make sense because we'd say um, delivery. And it's, it's always small things like that. But it, you know, as they add up, it alienates the user and they, they get confused. So the idea is, again, remove those pointy bits and just make it comfortable. So. Um, I think this, this type of approach is required you know, across the board, basically, if we're serious about delivering that degree of comfort well, to all our users. So this is great in terms of functionality. I'm just thinking, if you have a very content-heavy site, and I'm talking about something that's content created and edited by users, is there automation behind this? You know, sh why should, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's actually a different, that's a different problem. Um, and this doesn't address that at all. This is really about user interface strings sure. as do opposed you, do to you know content. Anything in that? Do you know anything on that front that, that could possibly work with this module? For content? Yeah, yeah just uh, the trans automation of translation. No, I, I, I'm afraid I don't actually, but hopefully maybe somebody else does. But uh, no, I've only looked at it from the point of view of the structural strings in the interface. But yeah, it, it's probably generally a problem. And I think in it always needs some degree of attention and you know search engines are great to help us reduce the amount of time we need to spend on it but ultimately we have to take responsibility for those things so thanks for your question hi uh, my question is more from the ui designer standpoint and speaking to your users and what you were saying about idioms and the language um, you basically use the term role in two different ways how drupal defines roles with permissions and then how the UI designer would define the role from the user's perspective. Um, we have a very similar situation to what you've demonstrated here, and we reached a lot of the same conclusions as you did. Identify who you're registering first. Is it yourself, your child, whoever, and start from there. Um, one thing I'm stumbling over is the use of the term role. Um, have you been in a situation where you've had to expose the term role, for example, if you're registering your child and they have three different roles to choose from. I've stumbled over the word role. I'm just uncomfortable exposing that word to a user in the context of our application. Have you well, my run into that? My interpretation of the word role is it's kind of like shop talk. It's not something I'd want to expose in the Yeah, in the same thing here, and I haven't found the workaround for that word to expose to the user. I think it's an important concept. 
uh, but I, I, I see it as it always translates to something very specific. For example, in our case here, it's register me, register my child, register. There's always some specific expression which is natural to the narrative aspect, the mindset. And so I don't think there's a need to actually expose the word in that kind of abstract way. Uh, we just have to focus on what is the flow of thought that's probably going to be happening. And, and of course, that we can measure by talking to actual users. Okay, yeah, so we probably just need to reword, like we've got a screen that says, choose the role you want to register for, player, coach, volunteer, blah, blah, blah. So we just need to look at getting that out of there. Basically. Yeah, I, I think it's not uncommon. Be, as you can probably see, the story I've been telling here is that those wards, when they are uh, defined as part of the development process, what happens naturally is development terms leak out onto the screen, and that's what often confuses users. What I'm suggesting here, of course, is let's put a buffer in there and let's take control of that language. Great, thank you. Thanks. In your, in your module or in your implementation, do you see, I mean, do you see a, it, it looks like what we need here is a parallel, so you have roles in Drupal, and then you have, for lack of a better term now, narratives. And if you could add narratives, like you could add roles, and, and, and possibly a narrative could, you know, somebody could have two different narratives and have bunches of different roles, and now with fieldable entities and all that, you know, they can have, we could do that. But are, have, are you walk, working toward that, or where, where are you on that? I think, uh, yes, I've been wanting to work towards this for years. <laughs> I've used the module in, in other websites before, just because um, it seemed to be the right thing to do. Um, for example, a year ago, uh, I had a situation where uh, we did something for um, science fair projects, and uh, we found out at the last minute that the students that were registering their science fairs were actually much younger <laughs> than we realized. We thought it was high school, it was actually junior school. And the teacher gave us the feedback. They won't understand these words because we use slightly technical, slightly complex words. It was no problem to change it. We had the string resource file, we simply changed it. We didn't have to break the code. We didn't have to risk break, breaking the code. So um, it's, um, it's just a very useful tool in that sense. And, and I, I think it's a very, um, you know, it helps de-risk all those things. In terms of where it could go, I don't know. It, this is the first kind of coming out of the closet in the Drupal community, right? So we'll have to see where it goes. If people want it, then hopefully we, that snowballs and, and, and that, that is registered. We still would then have to deal with the technical things and how to keep developers happy because this obviously is a change for the developer experience and we don't want to break that because most of them are volunteers anyway, right? So, so we have to be careful on both sides. But for now, the idea is just to put it out here and get those discussions going. Thanks. Uh, first, thank you. Very excellent presentation. Um, <clears throat> One of the issues that I think that one of the other questioners was asking and that I also have a trouble with is we have a large website for multiple users. How do you get to the point where you can understand which narrative they're coming from? I think it's talking to them, isn't it? It's, um, it's always starts from that. And if, if we have the time and budget to do that, it's much better, I think, isn't it? Because um, they always, and that's why that, that one head has big ears, right? That's where it really starts, isn't it? So um, they will give clues. You can't take, I don't think, you, you probably find this as well, I don't think we can take users literally when they ask for things. You really have to sort of step back a bit and see, you know, what are they, what's the goal, not what was the expression of the goal. Um, and I think all of that is part of the design process and that's where you start to formulate a sense of, okay, generally, are there, cat are there clusters of user types that we can, give a name to and ultimately assign into a variable like that one we had. So from a user interface perspective, how would you ask the user to self-identify as, for instance, we're at a university or a college, a faculty member or a staff person or a student? I think it really gets down to um, asking them at a very high level about their goals. What are you trying to do? What gets in your way? And then certainly, we'd want to avoid asking them how they use a given application, because that's probably a workaround. Um, so, you know, couch it in terms of, in an ideal world, in that sunny place, what would life be like, you know, as you carry out your job, or, you know, do your entertainment, whatever it is, right? And then, 
you know, listening attentively to that to, to see, you know, what are the patterns that, uh, that are suggested, especially if you do, I mean, the patterns coming from multiple people, of course, like you'd see something in common, and that's what you can actually build upon, I think. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, from a prior session, uh, uh, we were looking at entities and fields and how all that's changing, and one of the thoughts that came into my mind when you were talking about this was fields are fieldable now, so that might be you know, a possible solution to for an implementation of something like this? Um, yeah, I'm not going to say I know a lot about fields. I haven't had a chance to look at the fields API yet, but I'm very excited about the idea that you can get into that degree of articulation of, of data. I think that's really a good thing. So I have two questions. The first question is, you said that a person could log in and have multiple roles. How do you deal with something like that? Well, what we did was we, uh, we, we used parallel sort of interface mechanism, like, like checkboxes as opposed to radio buttons or drop-down selectors, and then tabs. Within a reasonable uh, you know, number, you can afford the real estate to do that. We, you know, we, we could fit three additional tabs in that space. Uh, I've had other, uh, the thing about roles is that there's always some form of role uh, switching. There's, there's always some, point at which the user changes hats. I've designed other interfaces where there was a drop-down system, a drop-down uh, menu, where they could look at things from uh, quite different points of view, and, but it was expressed in terms that would relate to their jobs. So I'm gonna do this now, and then the user interface changes somewhat to allow, it changes the tool set. So there is a kind of a conscious switch on the part of the user, I think. In this case, we're picking it up on the implicit decision when they go to a tab that's labeled accordingly, my, my family or whatever, my students, there's an implicit role selection there. And then we keep that knowledge inside the system. And then that's what flavors the, the common wizard that they all share in the appropriate way. So it's kind of like a default role that you... I, I, I think you do have to build for defaults as well. Um, for, but for, but for ideally, you wouldn't let that leak out too much. The second is, is this going to be a project on uh, Drupal.org? Oh, I meant to mention, if people are interested, we'd certainly be happy to contribute the module and, uh, and, and set out, you know, doing, you know, whatever follow-up tutorials or, uh, you know, sort of helping out with that that we can do. Um, so if people are interested in that, you know, let me know after and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll know. I think it'd be a good contribution. Thanks. Sorry, I'm not tall enough. Um, <laughs> no, the microphone is too tall. Oh, yeah, so I just had a question. Um, I'm from a university, and I'm interested in using this for our faculty and uh, students. But I'm wondering, is there, do you see any problem in terms of instruction? So if a faculty member has a different view, and they're trying to teach the student how to use the website, they'll have to learn both sites, or both uh, language um, and idioms. So do you have any suggestions on how to overcome that, or do we just tell them too bad, you have to learn both? Uh, I may be misunderstanding this, but what I'm thinking that has to happen first is you need to have a developer build that custom module. <laughs> Well, oh. yeah. yeah okay. But it, it, I'm, I'm assuming that after okay. uh, this is so implemented. Then, so then the other part is, again, to have the conversations with the teachers, right, and with the students, and to find out what their, what their expressions are, what are their word sets, and then to identify the points. You can do it, you know, with user testing, if you already have something to test, or, or if it's a mock-up, you can do it that way as well. But find out where all those difficult spots are, and identify those as the strings that you want to actually, you know, modulate, and then that's what the, your your developer would focus on on doing. Um, I don't know if I answered your question though. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thanks. Any more questions? Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming and, and staying through the whole thing. Thanks a lot. <laughs>